Hello to everybody once again. We are not complete yet, however, I think we can start with another uh, panel which is dealing with uh, uh, the Middle Eastern conflicts with, uh, from yet another perspective. It is the perspective of uh, weaponry. Because, uh, as you know, and this is probably an information for our foreign guests, that, uh, uh, for example, in the Czech Republic, our, our government actually is uh, trying to deal or to contribute to the campaign against uh, Middle Eastern terrorism, particularly against so-called Daesh or Islamic State, by deliveries of weaponry, arms and ammunition uh, to Kurdish a government in Iraq and also to uh, Iraqi central government. And now the crucial question is, do we really help to stabilize the region or do we rather undermine it, its stability, its security of local population, of local ethnic groups, minorities, for example, the Yazidis who were described in a rather dark, uh, dark uh, uh, perspective in a previous uh, panel. So now uh, our next guest, who also arrived from abroad, is uh, Peter Wezeman, who is working for Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or as we know it, CIPRI, which uh, produces every year an uh, annual report on international global uh, arms and weaponry transfers. And uh, Peter is uh, dealing with uh, its Middle Eastern part. So. Thank you very much that you also arrived to Prague and uh, I hope you will at least try to answer that my mentioned crucial question. Does the Czech Republic help the peace and security of Middle East or not? Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Bratislav. Um, yes, uh, I will try to find a way or try to present both facts and information which can help to find an answer to that question. Obviously, I don't have the answer to the question itself. I'm only one person. I'm working at an in institute which first and foremost tries to collect the kind of information which we need to start to ask these questions. And then we try, with the help of very short case studies often, to shed some light on how, when arms transfers take place, um, actually these may have an impact on stabilization or the stab stab stabilization of, of, of a region. Um, again, I won't have an answer, but what I again will do is I will give you some basic ideas of, in this case, what I would call the militarization rate of the Middle East in the first place. And I'll do that with the help of some information which we collect at CIPRI, and we spend a lot of time and effort on doing that on the military expenditure in the world and therefore also in the region. And what we do see here is that the Middle East is a region where military spending is very high. It is a relatively small region in the world, but we can see that there are several countries there which are amongst the highest military spenders in the world, despite their limited size. Take, for example, Saudi Arabia. In our estimates, it is at this point in time, in 2015, the third largest military spender in the world. And that's a country with approximately 30 million people living in there. Compare that to, for example, the other countries which are in approximately the same league, in the same order of magnitude when it comes to military expenditure. Um, Russia, the UK. These are countries which are two, three, four, five times bigger than Saudi Arabia. We also see, for example, the UAE there, a little bit further down there. Together, the UAE and Saudi Arabia already stand for something like six, six and a half percent of global military spending. A clear, a clear indication of the uh, militarization rate uh, of the region. Though again, I have to stress, um, when we talk about military expenditure, um, it is only an input factor. It is, doesn't tell us what the actual output is. It tells us something about how countries perceive the need for spending on their military. It tells us something about the need for that countries see to build up military capability. But it is not the same. Military capability uh, is much more than military spending alone. 
Military spending in the region then again, it amounted to about two, uh, 200 billion in 2014. And we see that that's a significant increase both compared to 2013 and also compared to uh, 10 years ago. Now you may wonder why I suddenly switched from figures from 2015 to 2014 and there's a very specific reason for that. And it is uh, related to some of the issues which have been discussed, especially in the first presentation we um, have had today. And namely the fact that there is a lot of information la lacking. It is very hard to understand what the local perspective is, what the local reasoning and thinking is um, amongst the decision makers within the elites in the re region about why they actually uh, are spending that much on their military capability and not on other very urgent needs which as we have heard so clear, clearly also exist in the region. Development uh, also of the richest state uh, could uh, uh, get a lot more attention. Um, but no, we don't have that information and so for example the information for 2015 excludes military expenditure figures for major states uh, in terms of spending at least uh, such as the UAE Qatar, um, and also states which are in conflict, such as uh, Yemen uh, and uh, such as um, um, Syria. Um, also, I've given here a few figures which give us some indication of how the differences are between the states in the region. You have those states which have expanded their military spending very significantly over the past 10 years. Saudi Arabia is an obvious one. The UAE uh, has increased its military spending more than twice. Uh, and Iraq, of course, uh, building up its armed uh, for forces uh, over those years has increased by uh, almost, uh, well, more than six times. Times. At the same time, there are also states uh, such as Israel, Egypt, which, according to the figures that we have available, um, seem to be more stable in their military spending over those 10 years. And then you have states which have seen a decrease for different reasons. And the most interesting the one there to mention is Iran. Um, Iran is still comparatively a, a, a smaller spender in the region when it comes to uh, its military territory. And why is that the case? Well, obviously, they are in an economic situation where it is extremely hard to divert money to uh, their military uh, cap cap capabilities. And they have been under uh, UN sanctions, which make that even more difficult. Again, when you see these figures, I have to stress all the time the accuracy is limited. These are figures based on what states themselves tell us about their spending. Now, if we look at this, um, at these fig figures, I'll go back once more, um, then this can be spent on a number of things. One of them is arms, and arms are a very important element of the military cap capability of states. Um, but when these states want to buy arms, they cannot do that from their own industry. They don't have a very developed arms in the industry, with a few exceptions there. Israel is, for example, a country which has built up an arms in the industry, which is capable of at least catering for part of the uh, military uh, requirements that Israel uh, uh, perceives to have. Uh, in Turkey we see a similar development, a military industry is being, uh, um, is, is under construction. Uh, the, the Turks hope to build up an industry which be, will be similar to those which we find, of course, uh, uh, for example, in a number of European states. But none of the other states has reached really anything when it comes to uh, real advanced military in industries. So, in fact, uh, almost all countries in the region, um, for all of them, imports more or less equal uh, arms procurement. None of them has developed a significant indigenous arms in industry. And that means that it's very important then to look at the role of the arms suppliers in this regard and the role of arms imports by the region. And that's one thing we also do at CIPRI, we collect a lot of information on arms uh, imports and exports in order to provide this kind of overviews on a global and regional level of the uh, total uh, uh, arms, of, of the trends and patterns uh, in arms transfers. Um, yeah. 
And as you can see also in this case, the Middle East makes up a very significant part of such uh, uh, arms transfers. It is a very major market, uh, both in political terms and economic terms, for arms. Uh, we also see here very clearly, again, this uh, uh, development in what you could call the militarization of the region. Uh, Saudi Arabian arms imports increased by 275% in our CIPRI estimates. Again, the accuracy of that can be discussed, but it gives you an indication of the general trend. We see how uh, the UAE has increased its arms imports significantly, how Qatar, uh, a very small country, has decided to completely uh, build up a completely new and very advanced uh, military for, for itself. And of course, not surprising, we also see how Iraqi arms imports have uh, significantly increased. <coughs> Saudi Arabia, well, obviously the largest uh, arms import in the re region, the, U the UAE, the next one, uh, followed by Turkey. Um, all the figures I can give if you are interested in it. And here, once more, the overview to give you a bit the global context again here. Saudi Arabia is the second largest arms import in the world. It is an extremely important market for the uh, for several uh, arms industries, in particular in Europe, and I'll come back to that later. Now, how then does all this affect stability in the region, um, and therefore also the security and, uh, of, uh, and, and, and lives of people in the region, the topic of, of this meeting today? Now, I don't have an answer to that, of course, but I can only give a few examples um, within a limited time I have available to talk about, to give you an idea of what the issues may be when weapons are being transferred to the region. When, for example, the government of the Czech Republic, but also many other states in the, in the region, <coughs> have to make uh, decisions about whether or not to supply arms and to, to make an assessment about how these weapons may have an effect on the conflict uh, to where these weapons may go. And I've chosen two of the examples which I've looked at a little bit more uh, over the past few years. Um, one is the example <coughs> of Syria, Iraq, the, the conflict there which so closely have um, hang, 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 hang together now with the emergence of uh, the IS. And I've looked at the case of Yemen. I could have chosen, of course, many other different examples. As we all know, um, there are plenty of other <coughs> conflicts ongoing in the regions. We've heard about that in the first presentation. We've heard about um, the conflicts in Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Syria, Turkey, uh, Israel, of course, and Yemen. I've chosen two of them. Important in this regard is also what has been mentioned before, the uh, uh, tense relations, the, the, the rivalry b uh, between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and also Iran and some other states in the region, which kind of uh, uh, has an impact on all of these conflicts to some extent, and we see that also when we look at uh, the issue of arms transfers to the region. Now, if we then look at the case of the arms transfers to uh, both Syria and Iraq and how they have an impact on the conflict there, I think there are a number of things which I want to mention there, though I don't want to go into the full detail of it. I don't have the time for that. Um, but what we first see, and I think we can go back to 2003, um, when the US invaded um, uh, Iraq and then started to rebuild the Iraqi armed Forces. We see a very uh, large flow of weapons coming in, in, in the first place from the US, but also from a number of Western European states, including the Czech Republic, which um, started to supply these weapons to Iraq for two particular reasons. For, for, for the US, the main reason was clearly the uh, idea of rebuilding the armed forces of Iraq. Other states may have had some other interests in there too. For the Czech Republic, one of the reasons probably will be and has been also the industrial interests uh, involved in this, the efforts to maintain an arms industry in, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic. And similarly, we see that also in other states in, uh, the, um, uh, in Europe. 
Now, during this time, we see that, especially the US, then pulls in large numbers of mainly kind of light type of arms, armored trucks, and also very, very many uh, small arms and light we 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 weapons. And when they do that, they already find out quite soon that it is very difficult to keep track of these arms, to actually uh, ensure that the weapons stay in the right hands, in the hands of those military or militias which are supposed to use those arms to create some sort of security in Iraq. Then by 2011, the US withdraws. It starts to further uh, increase its arms exports to Iraq and includes also more heavy arms. Now, in the meantime, in Syria, we see another development, of course. Um, there, the, since 2011, the conflict breaks out and several, a large number of different groups start to fight mainly against the regime of Assad, but also against, their, uh, uh, against each other. And there we see a very different trend when it comes to arms flows. We see three major channels which are being used. First, in the beginning of the conflict, we see that uh, the uh, rebel groups, the different rebel groups, obtain their arms either through capturing them from the uh, um, forces of the Assad regime, either through military deserting to the rebel groups or by overrunning the arsenals of the regime, some of the weapons are obtained through illegal channels, are, are, are acquired on the black market in Lebanon, for example. And then, after a short while, foreign support starts. Several states decide that it is a good idea to help the rebel forces with um, arms, which they then start to supply. In the first place, these are states in the region, such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE, then followed, of course, by the US. In Europe, and this is an interesting aspect about this, there is a sense that providing more arms to Syria uh, is not necessarily going to lead to an end to the conflict. Many states in Europe um, call for an embargo, an, an arms embargo, and the EU imposes that for two years. By then, however, the UK and France decide that there are, they believe that it is useful to be able to supply arms to uh, the Syrian re rebels, and as a result, they basically force the other states to agree to lift the arms embargo. Admittedly, as far, to, as, far as I know, the, uh, France and the UK have limited their arms supplies to rebel forces in uh, Syria very significantly, but anyway, they wanted to open that possibility. Um, in the same, at, at the same time, we see the growth, the emergence, and then the growth of the Islamic State, um, and there we see a different pa 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 pattern. The IS does not seem to have many backers abroad. It doesn't really get arms for free from anyone. Um, nor is there a very clear evidence that IS can acquire the large volumes of arms on the illegal market. And what they do then is they capture the arms from the Syrian armed for for forces. That is their main source of weapons. And of course, also from the other groups in the region, in 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 the country, including those which have received the arms from uh, uh, just re -re recently from either the U.S. Uh, or from uh, uh, the, the states in the region. And with these arms, they then manage to grow. They manage to increase their their grip on parts of Syria, and also then attack uh, the Iraqi forces in Iraq. And that then is the, again one of the clear examples of the risks of supplying arms without being certain of how those weapons will be used over the longer term. The Iraqi armed forces had been supplied with very significant numbers of arms and still they were not capable of using those arms in an adequate way to deal with IS. Instead what happens is that the weapons are captured by IS and strengthen IS even further, creating an even bigger problem. The original idea that the weapons would help stabilize Iraq, uh, 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 Iraq in this case have failed. Um, and also one final issue related to the supply of weapons to Iraq, which we then see is, of course, that there will be there are emergency supplies. Weapons are quickly supplied by the U.S. by European states, also European states which aren't very keen on supplying arms in the first place, such as, for example, Germany. Those weapons are then 
supply there, but the big question is what will happen in the longer future with those arms? As we have seen, weapons have been supplied to Iraq, they didn't lead to the right result, they were used in a way which was not intended in the first place. And also in the case of the weapons which have now been supplied to, for example, the Kurds, and of course also the large numbers which have further been supplied to the Iraqi central authorities, the question is here, how long will they stay around and what will happen with those in the future and when or will they be, what is the chance that they will be used by those groups which have received them, not against IS, but against or between each other, either the Kurds against the Iraqi central authorities or uh, the Kurds, for example, also between themselves or, for example, in Turkey. So there is a whole range of issues which ha will have to be dealt with in the future on the basis of the fact that weapons have been supplied. One other example then which I wanted to give of how arms can be considered as stabilizing but also as de stabilizing a region or a country is the case of Yemen. And that's not so much um, the arms transfers to Yemen itself, but it is more the arms transfers to the states that are now involved in the intervention in that conflict. Um, just to quickly recall the conflict in Yemen, um, 2008, uh, to, to, to 2009, 2010, we see the first major combat between, on the one hand, the Houthis, and on the other hand, the central uh, authorities in Yemen, um, then there is a period of tranquility and then we see that the Houthis um, again go on the offensive and take over most of the country in 2014 and 2015. Um, we see how already in 2009-2010 the Saudis uh, became involved in the conflict um, and at that time we also see how the Iranians became involved in the conflict and this is very important, the, the whole uh, constant uh, um, uh, rivalry between Saudi Arabia, Iran, between the Arab Gulf, Gulf, Gulf states and Iran and how this plays also in the case of, of Yemen. Now. In reaction to the success of the rebel alliance, we see that Saudi Arabia then uh, organizes a coalition of states. The UAE is very important in that too. Qatar is important. A number of other states play a role in that too. Um, and they start the intervention in Yemen. And here is an overview of the arms transfers to the states that were involved in or are involved in the intervention in Yemen. And again, I show this overview to, to give an indication how the increased imports of arms in the region and to those countries over the past decade has really provided the capability <laughs> uh, for the states um, in, in the region to be able to stage the kind of intervention as we see in Yemen. They have received the kind of weapons which are needed to do this, whereas in the past they arguably weren't that far, far, far. they didn't really have the reach, they didn't really have the um, equipment to be able to coordinate uh, an, an, an intervention like this by themselves. They could do so together with, uh, in particular, under the leadership of the US, for example, as in the case uh, of Syria against IS, they have done that under the leadership uh, of um, uh, Western European states in Libya, but now they have tried to do this for the first time and with apparently some, some basic success. The main suppliers to uh, the, the countries in, in the region were um, uh, the US, uh, France and the UK. And those have of course different drivers for their arms exports to the region. One driver is for sure, in particular in the case of the US, that weapons are supplied to help these countries to build up um, uh, a certain military cap cap capability uh, which they perceive as needed to deal with uh, the security threats uh, they see. But of course it is also important to stress that other reasons do play an important role for the arms exports to these countries. And I'm thinking there in particular um, in Europe, to a lesser extent in the US, the, uh, in the, the importance of maintaining an arms industry as perceived by states here in Europe leads them to support arms exports to the region. 
There, the security reasons are not that strong. It is very much about maintaining, about ensuring that the military industry in Europe um, continues to exist, uh, despite the fact that the demand for weapons in Europe itself has diminished very significantly in recent, in the past decade or so. So to maintain your industry, you have to export, and as we already saw, saw, it is here where a lot of money is available for the procurement of arms. So this is where the markets are. It is no longer the security uh, reasons which drive the exports, or it isn't in part of the KK cases in, in any case, it is very often the industrial reasons in Europe which do so. Now there are then some concerns about the arms exports uh, in Yemen and the one which really um, is predominant in 2015 is the fact that the Saudis are alleged by several NGOs which have done field research but also by a United Nations panel of experts that they are involved in military operations uh, that are not taking into account the international humanitarian law, military operations that uh, damage uh, civilian uh, buildings and cause civilian uh, cas cas casualties to uh, a degree which is unacceptable. And so we do see that there is, within Europe at least, a discussion about the possibility to um, uh, impose an arms embargo. Within the European Parliament there is even a resolution which calls the EU to uh, consider such an embargo. This does not happen. There is no interest on the side of states in Europe to actually continue with such an embargo. And there are, of course, again, the two drivers which have to be mentioned. The perception on the one hand that weapons can contribute to stability in the region, but also very strongly the perception or the, uh, the need for maintaining a military industry in Europe, um, which can only exist if um, uh, there are sufficient arms exports to maintain it. Um, the last thing then I want to add, because I get to the end of the time I have, I think the last thing I want to add to this is of course that the concern related to the supply of arms to the coalition state is about how they are going to use it in Yemen. That is a, a valid concern, but it's not the only concern. And maybe the more important concern is that uh, the question is how the increased arms imports by these states in the Middle East um, will impact overall regional security, how states in the region will handle the tools of violence they have obtained. Um, the use of the advanced military capabilities in, Ye in Yemen by regional states raises the question if the growing arsenal of advanced weapons will uh, embolden these Arab states to use force as part of their policies towards other uh, perceived threats. Um, and we have to think again in terms of that rivalry between Saudi Arabia and between Iran, between the Arab states or the Sunni Arab states uh, and, and Iran. Uh, and the risk that the weapons which are being acquired, acquired will add to the tensions between these two sides where it is very important to constantly mention that the current situation, the current development, the current trend is still that there is a growing asymmetry in terms of military capability between, on the one hand, the arsenals of the Sunni Arab states uh, on the Arab Peninsula, and on the other hand, the stagnating military capability, in conventional terms at least, on the Iranian side due to the fact that Iran still is coping with massive economic problems and has been doing so for the past 20 years uh, or so, and secondly also because Iran still remains under United Nations arms embargo. It can't acquire the advanced military equipment which other states in the region have access to. So this, I think, is a major issue which also has to be taken into account when states in Europe or in the US or elsewhere make decisions about further supplying arms to the region. And it is very important that they take these things into account um, and do not let the economic and industrial reasons, motives, drivers for arms exports take over as the prime reason for allowing such arms exports to take place. Now again, this just sketches the overall 
picture of arms <laughs> transfers and military spending to the region with the intention to give some food for thought without me being able to give a final answer to that question. Do arms transfers actually stabilize or destabilize the region or particular parts of the region? I think that's uh, an issue which needs a lot more further discussion and I can only kind of scratch the surface there uh, of what has to be said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let me to ask now my first question. Maybe I will surprise you a bit, but I would like to know. Uh, we know that uh, ordinary Yemeni men, they have a, almost, it's a, almost a rule that every adult man in Yemen should have at least one Kalashnikov. That means there is some psychological level in that. Would you also find such a psychological level be behind this drive to buy weaponry in such enormous uh, amount by Middle Eastern nations? I think that's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. But because it is a very essential element in trying to understand why states acquire arms. Um, I've talked about different aspects. That aspect hasn't come up yet. Um, I have mentioned that it is very difficult to really understand, truly understand, the motives for arms procurement in the region. Because states in the region are very secretive about their military territory in general. Yes, they show it off in, 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 in parades, yes, they show it off in, in, in arms fairs, etc. But they are not very clear about what their thinking is behind it. It's not very clear who actually makes the decisions about these arms procurement and what they think they can achieve with it. There are no public white papers, there are no public documents which explain in detail what the, the defense doctrine of these states is. We have to constantly um, assess that on the basis of their actions, on the basis of statements made on a more ad hoc basis by the uh, uh, people that um, uh, rule the country. And then we still have to be kind of almost guess if they really are the people who make these decisions. These things happen behind closed doors. And that is important to take into account. There the issue comes up, to which extent is it so that weapons are acquired as a status symbol? To which extent are they acquired as a symbol of prestige? And we shouldn't also forget to which extent does corruption in some form also play a role in this. Is it really so that Saudi Arabia is buying the most advanced arms because they are convinced they need those arms in those quantities? Or is there also a risk that they see them as something similar as, for example, the fact that they built the highest building in the world? You have that, you also want to have the best fighter aircraft, or at least the best one you can get your hands on. You have a Ferrari, you also want to have a Euro fi fi fighter with lots of bombs. Now, of course, it isn't that simple. But this might be one of the reasons why there is such an interest in such military gear. And that in turn then leads to the question, okay, if you buy that for prestige reasons, don't you risk then further destabilizing the region because the other arguments, namely the fact that the other guy has it too, will play too. And so, for example, if Saudi Arabia, now when Saudi Arabia buys significant quantities of advanced arms, with which it's increasingly, for example, can reach into Iran, at least theoretically, if they can use the weapons to the technological capabilities these weapons have inherently built in, if they have the people to actually fly them, if they have the people to operate them. But if they, if they have, then of course Iran will look at that and will think, well, we need something too. Right now, they cannot lay their hands on advanced military equipment in the same way as the Saudis can. But, of course, they can seek other means to deal with that real or perceived asymmetry in military capability. And that includes, for example, also the possibility of trying to influence uh, Shiite groups throughout the region, trying to, to co-opt them for the interests of Iran. 
So thank you very much for the presentation. I, I love the work that's being done at CIPRI, and I think that your presentation was a good reflection of that as well. Uh, I just have a question, if you've come across this as an expert, um, in relation to small arms transfers versus large arms transfers, in terms of like, for example, uh, artillery versus and air power versus uh, small arms. Because from my perspective, um, an Iranian-Saudi balance of power uh, on the national military level is more likely if both sides have, let's say, a rough, an estimated uh, balance between their air forces, between their naval forces and whatnot. But as we've seen in Yemen and we've seen in other parts of the Gulf region, that this balance of power between the two countries doesn't guarantee that they're not going to engage in proxy conflicts given the scale of small arms transfers. So my question is if whether you've come across any research that would demonstrate or be able to show um, how the small arms transfers are going to affect proxy conflicts versus the larger arms transfers that are going to affect the balance of power on a higher level. Thank you. Okay, there is a, a, a lot of research being done, not at CIPRI, surprisingly enough, but by others, um, primarily on this kind of flows of small arms. And in the region, of course, um, I can only just kind of illustrate it or talk about it in terms of a few examples. When we look at the Yemeni conflict, yes, it is very much driven by the availability of small arms. Small arms which had been there already before, um, but surprisingly enough, despite the fact that small arms have been common in Yemen and in the hands of most Yemeni men over the age of 15 or so, or at least in the north of, of uh, Yem Yem Yemen, it used to be different in, in the south, but still, um, despite that fact, there still is a demand for more small arms, and it is very much to, it's very important to take that constantly into account how that the small arms actually do give the local population the, popu the, the opportunity to start the kinds of revolts which we have seen both in Yemen to some extent in Syria, although there it's a lesser the case there. I think it was more about the, the weapons in the hands of the uh, armed forces which were kept, kept, captured. Then, of course, the other aspect of this is that both sides or all sides um, and, I'm t and when I'm talking about s both sides, I mean here uh, Iran on the one hand and Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar on the other hand, both have made very active use of the supply of small arms and other lighter, smaller military equipment to rebel forces to uh, try to uh, establish themselves as the... the, the the major power in the region. We have seen how Iran has done that towards Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon. We've seen how they've done on it in Yemen. But of course, we also see how Qatar and the UAE have very actively done that in Libya, uh, undermining the regime of, 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 of Gaddafi and helping the rebels there to get rid of Gaddafi, but at the same time also creating complete chaos in Libya itself, or at least contributing to that. Um, and we see how these countries, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, have done it um, in Syria, where on the one hand the Iranians are supporting the Syrian or the, or, or the Assad regime, which primarily, I guess, major arms, although it will also involve small arms, and the other side pulls in uh, small arms and light uh, weapons. And so the proxy wars are fed by these flows of small arms and light we 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 uh, weapons. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a very interesting chart. Sometimes we don't think about Spain or Turkey being such suppliers to Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. I, I was quite surprised. Um, I have a question in line with uh, what you said right now about small uh, supplies. Uh, we're in the past, I work in the field of uh, media and we've been fed in the past, let's say, mainly two years uh, about who sees as Iran-backed Shia group. And then in the past uh, months, for some curious reason, they have become, at least in the English-speaking media, they have become Iran-allied uh, Houthis. So uh, it, it has been a shift in the, the way that people are um, addressing uh, this group in Yemen. And I want to know if you, in your research, have uh, got into actual uh, data of Iran supplying arms to the Houthis, because we hear randomly some news comes 
that the French Navy uh, uh, confiscated something in some sea somewhere which was aimed uh, for Yemen and then the news disappears like two hours later and we don't know what was this actually. So I want to know if there is an actual data there, if there is an evidence of support for the Houthis from the side of Iran. Thanks. Um, that's a very good question uh, because it's very much about what do we actually know about these arms flows. When we talk about major arms, yes, I can pinpoint a lot and I can say like, well, that's really roughly what happens. But when it comes to these arms flows, these more, overt, to, uh, these more covert arms flows, specifically of small arms and light we we weapons, there is an enormous amount of guessing around and there is an enormous amount of claims, but it is very hard to say anything about the scope and the volume here. Now, I have done, not done that research myself, but in the case of Yemen, there happens to be the United Nations panel of experts, which, who have a very specific job, namely to establish if the United Nations sanctions, which uh, are valid for Yemen, are being uh, followed. Um, and so their job is also to establish if the arms embargo, which exists on the Houthis, on the non-government side, if that is being uh, implemented, or if there are those which break it. Um, and if you look at their report, which is very extensive, it came out two months ago, I think. Um, yes, they give a few examples, the ones you gave, similar ones, uh, which indicate that Iran is involved in the conflict, and they, d they do send arms. But they don't really tell you that it is enormous amounts. No, they just say we have a few K cases on the basis of which we know that something is going on there. But is that sufficient then, as you say, to actually state that the Houthis are heavily supported by Iran? Well, in itself, no, it isn't. We don't have sufficient information to say that with any certainty. We would have to be very careful with that. Um, and and I, I fully agree with your assessment there. Thank you. Okay. And please also identify yourself, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Jan from, from the Metropolitan University. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for such a great report. And my question is, uh, for how long has the Western powers been supplying uh, the Middle East with the weapons? Was it also prior to the 2003 intervention? Thank you. Um, yes, the Middle East has been a very important uh, target, you could say, for Western, uh, US, uh, European, but of course also for Russian arms exports since basically, well, since almost ever, but specifically, of course, since uh, oil uh, became into play. Um, if you would look at the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian arms Im imports, you see an enormous spike in the 1970s, um, in the 1980s. Then it falls a bit. They have to kind of absorb all the fancy equipment which they import. They have to find the pe people to use it. And, and then you see recurrence again over the past 10 years. But it has been a constant flow. But I think it has increased. Our figures at least indicate two things. They spend more um, and they therefore they import more. And that's very clear over the past decade or so. Thank you. Uh, just uh, to add something, uh, even during the First World War, both the sides the Germans and British, they try to match each other while offering weapons to Bedouin tribes in today's Saudi Arabia in order to get them on their side. And I think since then the local Arab, Arab leaders know how to play this game. This is probably why we have so many weapons coming to the Union. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've, I've been once in Yemen and, and I still remember I was there and with, with a car and it, it relates to this German kind of supplies and all that. And there was an older guy and had just been to the market and he had bought a new rifle and he had so he had his old German Mauser model 19010 or whatever and he had his new Kalashnikov and then he got, 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 got a ride on top of the car in which I was, which was a bit of a strange thing. This was. 20 years ago, uh, things probably haven't changed that much in Yemen in that regard. The other question. I'm not sure that I would like a specification regarding your data. I take it that you're referring to conventional weapons, mm -hmm. 
And I was wondering about the picture when it comes to non-conventional weapons, CBRN, and especially nukes. What are the trends in the region, taking into consideration the more recent developments regarding the denuclearization mm -hmm. of Iran? So, what is happening there? What's happening is that, as far as we know, there is one country in the region which has nuclear arms, and that is I Israel, despite the fact that they keep denying it, but we all know it's there. Um, we also know that there's one other state which could deploy them or which deploys them everywhere in the world, that is the US. And then, of course, there's always the constant question about what is Iran up to. Um, as far as it goes, as far as I can judge based on the information that is available, Iran hasn't gotten that far at all. And this is also the conclusion of the International Atomic Energy a Agency. They have in the past worked to some extent on efforts to build up something which could lead to a nuclear weapon, not necessarily building them or with intention to build them, but at least to build up the capacity to do so in a relatively short time if they would feel that the situation would require that for them. Um, but right now, that's not the case. So I think luckily we have now an agreement, and luckily that hopefully will help prevent that anyone else will get the idea that they would need nuclear weapons in the re region other than those which are already there. So conventional arms are the ones which, which are most important in that regard. Of course, the, the agreement with Iran then brings with it even more pressure, or at least an even stronger perception within Saudi Arabia, within the, U, uh, within the UAE, within Qatar, etc., uh, et which is that they will need even stronger defenses because now the sanctions will be lifted and therefore Iran will soon be capable of also acquiring similar uh, military capability as the others have, and also they will have the economic power to uh, support the Shiite groups throughout the region, uh, and to which could then undermine uh, the political systems that exist there. Thank you very much. So, no more questions. I don't see any any hands. Uh, sorry. No, it's just a quick question. Um, I would like to know if you have made some projections about the um, Saudi military expenditure in light of the drop of oil prices in the year ahead. What exactly you predict that's going to happen? Yes, that's an important que question in the sense that, of course, um, the high military expenditure in the region is driven by oil, uh, at least in the case of the Arab states. Um, and yes, the, the, the uh, drop, the steep drop in oil prices has a major effect on their bur budgets. It's extremely hard to make any predictions. The one thing which we have seen is that the Saudis, surprisingly enough, and I think that's probably the first time they've done so, have announced already in the end of last year, in 2015, that they do intend to decrease their military spending in 2016 very, very much. The problem there is that at the same time, their figures are very insecure because in the past, and also this time, they only give the budget figures for uh, defense and security, but they never say what they actually spend. And in the past years, they have always overspent their budget up to like 30%. <laughs> Potentially, that overspending went to the military bu budget. We just don't know. Um, so there are reasons to say that, yes, uh, the lower oil prices will have an effect on military spending in all countries in the re region which are dependent on oil, which is most of them, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, we will still stay in the level of weaponry, and now we will go to a specific uh, kind of weapons, which are the drones. Drones. Uh, our next speaker is Andrea Gili, who is a postdoc researcher at Metropolitan Uni University Prague. I sit with him in the same room, and his uh, desk is full of books on uh, uh, on uh, high-level weaponry, drones, and navy uh, uh, missile systems, and so on. So now, please let's stay only in the level of uh, of drones, okay, and yeah. but still we stay in the region because, as we know, the United States uh, military used has used them oh, in Afghanistan. I will change it in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and probably elsewhere. And of course, because we deal with the conflicts from the perspective of local people, 
I ask uh, Andrea to explain us what is the impact of uh, drone warfare on local population, because as we know, the official reason for their usage is to, uh, to eliminate terrorists, but maybe it creates another terrorist in the same time. So please go ahead. Thank yeah. you, you are here. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I mean, I will make a joke that, thanks God you didn't see Playboy in, the, in my office, but okay, no, nobody's laughing. Uh, so thank you for having invited me. Uh, I'm really honored. It's such a very interesting conference and a stellar set of participants. Um, as you say, besides that you organized all these, you propose a very interesting topic on which I've not worked that much uh, in a certain way. Although I was working on the industrial uh, project problems related to drone proliferation, I've never uh, really investigated too much uh, drone warfare. So for me, it was a great opportunity to try to understand more in depth this kind of issues. And I, I arrive immediately to the conclusion that my take is that drones are way less disturbing or problematic than we read in the media and also from scholars. Now, when you propose the topic and basically discuss, uh, oh, here is my introduction. So uh, well, let's move here. So when you propose the topic, um, uh, human, social, uh, societal, socio-political uh, costs of drone strikes, there is a methodological problem, is how do we assess them? Um, because at the end of the day, every single public policy has costs and benefits. So with just any figure uh, is uh, meaningless without a, an appropriate uh, comparison. We are all familiar with the strikes that the United States uh, has conducted in Iraq, Yemen, but we know less about their consequences and especially in a way, their relative benefits. Should we go on, or should the United States go on using drone strikes, or should they stop because they are counter-effective? Uh, I think the, the starting point to answer this question is to make a broader picture and realize that uh, there has been um, what Professor Lawrence Friedman from uh, King's College London calls uh, the revolution in strategic affairs. Basically, Western metaphysics is mostly focused about objects. We, st we talk about states as they were fixed, but if we look from a broader uh, historical perspective, we see that the international system is much more fluid. And in this fluidity, if you want, there are different processes that start in certain areas and we see the effects only later on. And certainly, one of these effects is exactly the rise of non-state actor, uh, actors of uh, these revolution in strategic affairs. What we see already during the Cold War, because of different technological and ideological <laughs> dynamics, the rise of non-state actors, violent non-state actors. Uh, and only, especially as the Cold War ended, we saw their role in war politics uh, uh, growing and becoming more important. Now, some of the predictions that were done in the 90s uh, were that state-on-state -state war would disappear. Probably they were exaggerated. But certainly, as part of the discussion today shows, the role of violent non-state actors has become increasingly important. So, but if violent non-state actors have uh, taken a more and more important role in the world. The question is how to counter uh, violent non-state actors. Now clearly here is more an art than a science, what you see uh, in this table. I basically try to understand how countries can try to neutralize uh, non-state actors. So, on the, so and the end goal is to see alternatives in, in order to uh, try to understand whether drone strikes and their cost are um, too high or too low. So if we think how uh, countries can uh, neutralize uh, violent non-state actors, they can actually rely on conventional approaches that is basically trying to control the territory, trying to impose a political victory, and is basically something similar to state-on-state -state war. This is what the United States did, for example, in Iraq or in Afghanistan at the beginning of the war. But obviously, these solutions may not always work. And you may have to uh, stretch. Oh, actually, so I have to uh, discuss the other part. Sorry. So, but if the the nature of 
the, the approach can be conventional or unconventional, where unconventional is just attrition, it's just killing, neutralizing militarily without any political solution. How to do it is mostly a matter of splitting between mass and precision. This is an arbitrary uh, division, but more or less gives you a feeling. Mass is about <laughs> employing massive violence, while precision is trying to be more surgical. Now, when states go for a conventional approach and employ mass, it's state-on-state -state war, like what happened in Iraq in 2003. But if you want to go unconventional but still uh, employ mass, this is what are remote strikes. If you think uh, about Iraq, for example, when it basically uh, in 1987, if I remember correctly, employed chemical weapons against the Kurds, this is what happens. Uh, Saddam Hussein didn't send directly an army, he just used long-range weapons or aircraft to basically kill a lot of insurgents. Uh, when you want to be more surgical, you can go for counterinsurgency that is uh, neutralizing terrorists and insurgent rebel networks, but also winning hearts and minds, promoting state development, and so forth. But unconventionally, you do something similar, and it's covered uh, or special operations. So you have this example in Yemen, in Somalia, but you have also in Vietnam, where the United States were using special operations to cross the border, kill a few people, and go back. It was called Operation Phoenix. Now, if said the, after having said that, there is an important a dynamic that we have observed over the past 50 years at least. It is the role of individuals at the international level has grown dramatically. More and more uh, states, or at least some states, prioritize the role of individuals. We see with United Nations conventions, we see also when countries are, uh, or at least Western countries, are uh, increasingly reluctant to deploy troops because they don't want to suffer domestic casualties. But also this applies in waging wars because there are precision munitions that basically allow to be more surgical to try to, lim uh, to limit uh, collateral damages. Now, I think this discussion here is relevant because it permits us, okay, the red here is not very clear, but so it should have been more uh, sketchy. Uh, where to locate drone strikes in the previous typology? Well, drone strikes more or less stay around here. They're not exactly counterinsurgency, but they're not even uh, covered uh, operations because they permit you to be surgical, they permit you to be, um, in a way, unconventional, but uh, they also allow for precision without committing for uh, ground troops. Mm. Now, more or less, sorry, okay, uh, more or less you all know what are uh, drones that are uh, a man air vehicles, so that is uh, aircrafts without a pilot. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that from a technological perspective, the difference between a drone and a normal aircraft is fairly limited. Only the pilot, rather than sitting in the airplane, is sitting on the ground. For the rest, the technologies are basically the same. The communication systems are the same. Are the, same. the sensors are basically the same. The missiles are exactly the same. So from a military perspective, the difference between a strike conducted with an un a drone and a strike conducted with an helicopter or with a combat aircraft is not that different. And also when you look in terms of effects, and I will look at it in a second. The, so, these are some figures uh, about uh, drone strikes, uh, at least where figures are available. Uh, so, the United States since uh, 2002 uh, has, uh, um, has basically launched strikes in these countries, uh, Pakistan, Yemen, there are some disputable, disputable figures in Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan. And you see the total drone strikes is uh, very high in Pakistan, is equally similar in Afghanistan. What is interesting is the numbers, as you see, there are almost in the upper level 4,000 people killed. And you see uh, the, a, sh a certain share that varies throughout the cases of civilians that have been, uh, that have been killed. And among those civilians, there are also uh, children. And then obviously there are some uh, 
uh, some people who have been uh, injured. Mm, no, now, <clears throat> the question is, uh, and here finally approach uh, the question of the, the human, social, societal, social political costs, so how to give a sense to these, uh, to these figures. So I think, first of all, okay, go in a second, uh, first of all, uh, it's useful to look at the existing literature in uh, the field of security studies that is about uh, uh, military effectiveness uh, and uh, decapitation strategies. Basically, when fighting against the terrorist groups or rebel groups, uh, uh, states have employed a simple strategy, try to kill or arrest the, the leadership in order to bring down the violence. Well, this literature, unsurprisingly, in the social sciences is uh, split. Some people believe that de decapitation works. Some people believe it does not. What is, uh, this question is important because if you reason with me, if drone strikes are effective, meaning they reduce violence, this, mean potentially, this means potentially that we can avoid using other strategies. And this goes back to the type, this typology. So if drone strikes really work, and they reduce, obviously there will, be, there, will, there will always be casualties, but they reduce significantly the total number of casualties. We don't have to set up a counterinsurgency in Afghanistan or in Iraq. We don't have to conduct cover special operations like now in Syria. Uh, two days ago, a uh, Navy SEAL was killed uh, fighting with the Kurds uh, on the border between Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Well, if drone strikes work, we can avoid uh, having at least our own troops killed. And obviously, even better potentially, we can avoid state-on-state uh, -state war or more massive uh, burst of violence. So what does this literature about, uh, about decapitation say? Well, it's split. Uh, there is a work from Patrick Johnston who finds that actually decapitation strategies work. They reduce violence and they uh, are statistically significant uh, in producing uh, a final victory in counterinsurgency. However, some recent works looking exactly at drone strikes uh, have identified a potentially problematic outcome. That is, <coughs> when you target the leadership of, the, of a terrorist group, the terrorist group may disappear, basically because people won't have any longer a leadership and so they may stop fighting. And that's a possibility. But there is also another possibility that basically the second lines will take power and the second lines will now uh, conduct, decide what to do. And what you observe, especially in groups that are fairly institutionalized and fairly resilient, so that there are more than a couple of people, is that the second uh, lines take power. The second lines tend to be more militant, less experienced, and so these second lines are more likely to use massive violence. So the implication is that if you conduct drone strikes, for example, in Pakistan or in Yemen, well, you you kill a terrorist leader, but the terrorist group will then produce much more harm to the local population because it's much more radical, much more ideological, much more strategic in a way. It's just more bloodthirsty, if you want. So this is a possible implication. And this discussion basically brings me to the second aspect that are uh, the human costs of uh, drone strikes. Now here I put <laughs> a table that is a comparison between the war in Vietnam and in Afghanistan and connects uh, with my initial discussion about uh, the, the revolution in strategic affairs and what I also said uh, slightly later about the, um, the increasing role of individuals. Now if you compare the two war Vietnam and Afghanistan, you see that Afghanistan is much longer, okay? It's 15 years against nine. But if you look at the number of casualties, Afghanistan is surprisingly clean, if you want. The total, the civilian casualties, uh, well, Vietnam produced uh, 587,000 civilian casualties. In Afghanistan, according to uh, uh, existing sources, is only 27,000. It's a huge difference. Uh, and if the population actually in Afghanistan is, uh, is higher, uh, okay, I don't know here, there's a mistake with the table, I apologize, I don't know what 
here means the total, oh, probably it's the total casualties. So if you sum coalition casualties, enemy casualties, civilian casualties in Vietnam, you have more than uh, 1,300,000 people. Here you have 7,000. It's a general trend in modern warfare that mm, the um, uh, the, the number of uh, casualties in wars have uh, as dramatically uh, decreased. And this is uh, an interesting starting point because what about drone strikes? Obviously there were some drone strikes in Afghanistan as well. We don't know all the figures, but there were many more in Pakistan uh, and in the other uh, countries. So, and here I try basically to make a comparison. It's a rough comparison, but it's just to try to reason a bit. Try, let's try to look at Vietnam, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, okay? Well, if we look, we see that drone strikes obviously create harm, create victims. But if you look, for example, coalition, uh, so civilian casualties over the population, in Somalia or Yemen, the number is extremely small. Okay, and the same is much higher in Vietnam and also in Afghanistan. Even more interesting is the ratio between uh, military and civilian casualties. Obviously military, so uh, it's the nominator. So as you see here, it goes very high. So it's true that drone strikes create a lot of create, uh, victims, but actually according to existing figures at least, well, they create mass le uh, much less uh, disruption and destruction. And this goes to the previous presentation about uh, the refugee camps that you have uh, in the Middle East. Drone strikes obviously create, uh, kill people, and war is about killing and it's about violence and it's never nice. But you don't displace hundreds of thousands or millions of people. You don't create wage, uh, waves of uh, refugees. I'm not saying that is the best strategy. This, I'm just uh, discussing some, uh, some data. And these figures at the very end tell us something uh, that uh, as in the general direction of counterinsurgency, well, there may be an argument that you still may uh, inadvertently kill uh, civilians, but you create much less disruption than if you invade a country. The amount of people killed in Iraq and Afghanistan is much higher for a simple reason, because a terrorist group, a rebel group, will play a strategic role, will try to kill civilians in order to intimidate, will kill civilians inadvertently <laughs> because it's targeting uh, coalition troops, and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, in one second I go there. Mm, there are also, obviously, some social, societal, and socio-political costs. Uh, uh, there is a report that got very famous was for two years ago. It was uh, called the Death from the Sky. It was from two law schools, uh, one Stanford Law School, in cooperation, uh, Stanford Law School and uh, the NYU Law School, both in the United States. They were finding that drones create uh, uh, anxiety because people hear the noise of the engine and are afraid it could be killed the, anytime. And obviously these, these, are, um, these, uh, these consequences are natural, but if you think in the perspective of the Syri uh, Syrian or Yemen civil war are much lower because we, we don't have figures showing that actually we know there's, there are not massive wave, waves of refugees from Pakistan. Because although drone strikes occur, they don't create as much discussion. I'm out, I'm late with the time. I've, well, there is lunch soon, so probably people uh, want to finish at the same point. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's the basic uh, logic. And if you think that the war in Yemen, it basically gives us uh, an interesting comparison. It's true that, as I saw before, as I showed before here, uh, the drone strikes in Yemen, but all these drone strikes, you know, Yemen was the first place where there was a drone strike in 2002, uh, but they've not created, uh, the civil war has created, if I'm correct, 300,000 refugees and probably one or two million of displaced people. Drone strikes have not created there. So what I'm saying is just that traditional war, civil wars, counterinsurgency, state-on-state -state war, are much, much more bloody and disruptive. Now, there is obviously, and you read in the media often, 
um, an additional argument that is that drone strikes are uh, bad at the ideological level. So this means they are um, creating terrorists, are creating support for terrorist groups, uh, and basically are undermining uh, uh, American policy and so forth. Well, in here I looked at these at some figures about. Uh, anti-Americanism around the world. Uh, so the Pew Research Center is, I think, the only institution that tracks systematically anti-Americanism around the world. Unfortunately, data are not available for all, all countries and in all times. And what is interesting, for example, is that Pakistan, this, this red, well, it went down here after the Iraq war. It went down a lot. This suggests that uh, people in Pakistan, because the United States decided to invade uh, Iraq, really had negative opinion. And then more or less remain, uh, went up. Although there were drone strikes, it never fell down so heavily and more or less has remained uh, constant or something like constant. You have in other uh, areas that were not affected by drone strikes, like Palestinian territories, you have up and downs. And unfortunately, the other countries you, don't, you cannot track. But if you know drone strikes, I don't have a figure, but uh, they've grown dramatically. So if let's say that the figure was about drone strikes, you should see a curve that go very up uh, as time passed by. Well, here you don't have uh, anti-Americanism uh, rising. Actually, you have the opposite because this is a favorable, favorable image of the United States, and actually, in some cases, at least, went up around the world. But there is another argument uh, that actually drone strike, obviously these are averages. You know? So when you have an average, you know, the classical uh, joke about statistics is that if I eat twice and Bratislav doesn't eat, everybody is eating because the average is each had one lunch. So statistics sometimes can hide something. So is it possible there is something hidden? There's an argument that drone strikes weaken the most uh, liberal and educated parts of uh, uh, societies. So I, there are different uh, people who have made this argument that basically drone strikes in Pakistan basically undermine the confidence in the United States uh, in the liberal elite and this basically makes the country on a worse path. Well, there is a problem with this argument that actually if there, there has been many studies of the liberal elite in Pakistan and what we know is that uh, the, the more educated, more, more liberal people in Pakistan actually are much more supportive of Islamic militancy than less liberal, less educated. So in a way actually here we have people who are already radicalized and it's not my job to judge on that but it's difficult to argue the other way around. So we have for right or wrong, uh, the liberal elite, at least in Pakistan in which we have data, is already radicalized or significantly radicalized without of, uh, of drone strikes. Now I'm basically over uh, what I, I try to reason a bit, there's obviously data are rough and not fully available and uh, one should, uh, should conduct a five years long study, gather a lot of data in order to reach some uh, uh, sound conclusions. But the, my general idea after having just looked a bit at these data is that I actually I don't really understand why people are so uh, crazy about drones because when people, so in other circumstances when drones are not used like Syria, like Yemen, like Nigeria and so forth, you have many more casualties. So uh, and here is just a counterinsurgency, counterterrorist strategy that actually is, uh, uh, is obviously killing people but it at least is killing way less than traditional approaches to uh, unconventional warfare and I'm done and so yeah more or less people should have also lunch in a decent time but I'm, I'm happy for questions obviously. Thank you. Um, well personally I don't like to discuss the matter because um, each individual matters and if it's 40,000 or 100,000 uh, each life matters uh, first thing first. But I want to ask you uh, 
when you bring these charts, you write uh, enemy casualties and civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. And I want to know uh, if uh, you can break down this enemy casualties. How much do we know that these people are really holding arms or we suspect them to become terrorists against us? Um, how do you study them and put together these numbers? Uh, what stands for mm -hmm. enemy casualty? Yeah, uh, let me just, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a violent person that is advocating for killing people uh, uh, for pleasure. But it's just a fact that, uh, you know, uh, Trotsky said that uh, if you're not interested in war, war will be interested in you. So at a certain point, uh, uh, like it or not, there are some people who are violent. And I don't think it's crazy that governments protect their own citizens to neutralize these terrorists. Now, if the alternative is between killing, uh, like in Vietnam, one million people, and having 7,000, well, it's true that every individual matters, but he, if you put them to the same level, you're killing many more people. So that's the logic of uh, my yard. Now, to your specific question, I took the, so the data from the Burov investigative journalist, that is an anti-drone uh, uh, group, basically. So they try to have I have a skeptical view of drone strikes uh, and have every reason to believe that, if, uh, that their figures are accurate uh, or that not downplaying. So that's where I took. I, in order to have more reliable data, I should go to Pakistan and, uh, uh, and conduct it myself, but I doubt it's feasible. But that, that, having said that, I know from, uh, I, I was uh, doing my research in the United States a couple of years ago, I know that many people believe that the real ratio are much higher, in a way going in your direction, meaning that the amount of civilians killed is much higher, okay? The, and we know, I mean, and, and actually your question is great for another uh, reason, because we know that uh, Obama basically relied on the signature strike, and I, I mean, it's a very broad topic, and we can discuss. The idea of signature strike is, uh, we track your phone, we track your whereabouts, we track your uh, phone calls, we track your internet, we fuse these da metadata, we reach the conclusion that you're potentially a terrorist, we s s um, launch a drone strike, you are a terrorist. Now, obviously, this was Obama's approach to uh, terrorism, whether it's appropriate or not is another matter. Uh, the, um, counting the figures is extremely difficult because not even Obama can uh, fully say that he has proved that these people were terrorists. Uh, I based uh, uh, my, my consideration on existing data and it's, you know, that's the only thing that I can do uh, at knowing that uh, the existing sources are not pro-drone uh, strikes. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a very famous example in the drone strikes and uh, those who are more against it is the case of, sorry, uh, the Yemeni uh, strike, uh, the, the one on Anwar al laki and then his son, yep. uh, both US citizens, right? And I want to know when we talk about his son, whether it stands uh, in the casualties of civilian casualty or this, enemy casualty. This, uh, Excuse me, please. Hanak, it's your third question, please identify yourself. No? Uh, it's Hanak Abiani from uh, this, Radio Free Europe. Yeah. These I, I actually don't. I should go looking. I could go looking. I actually don't know. I mean, so maybe people are not familiar. Uh, there was uh, uh, the, the child of a militant uh, was killed uh, in a drone strikes on the presumption that he was also responsible or something. Uh, I think it was between 12 and 16. Am I correct? Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I don't know. And also, I'm not saying that, uh, I would say, since the data are gathered by the broad investigative, investigative journalism, that they don't count him as such. But honestly, I don't know. Uh, you know, the, if I go, where are the, I mean, the whole strikes, you understand, are, uh, and I saw, or actually, the total figures of people killed are several thousands. Uh, uh, they have gathered the data, I, I don't know. But it's, it's a good question. And it uh, doesn't mean that there are not exaggerations or that Obama sometimes went on a killing spree. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. And 
uh, it's, I mean, that's mostly a matter of American constitutional law, whether you are allowed to kill American citizens without a due process. And, uh, and this goes um, to my discussion before that when you're fighting an enemy, it's legitimate to uh, strike back, it's less legitimate uh, to kill your own citizens. I agree, uh, but my role is not, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I, I don't do ethics, uh, I, I study security studies, so I, I can give you my personal opinion, but it's not uh, uh, an academic assessment on this. Sergey Danielskin, uh, Radio Free Europe. Uh, actually, I could make a counter argument if you go back to uh, a table uh, comparison uh, between Afghanistan and Vietnam, you would notice that you know just during Vietnam there probably were no drone strikes, mm -hmm. and uh, less population actually was affected. If, yes. you, if, if we look at pure numbers, well, right? It's, so it's, it's only 32 million versus 44 million. Well, Almost 45 million, right? Uh, nine years versus 15 years. So if we multiply, uh, it, it's just pure statistics. I think over there, uh, what, what is uh, a cost, uh, a societal cost that we're not looking into is actually failures or uh, publicized cases of large collateral damage. I can also make an argument that IRA, probably the most notorious uh, terrorist organization, if we're talking in terms of terrorist organization, was probably defeated without, uh, without use of um, drones, right? Versus, uh, you know, Bora Bora being massively bombed, uh, and then uh, uh, drones used, and, and still uh, the organization exists, right? So uh, over here, uh, of course, this is an evolving technology. There are cases when it is a covert action, whether it is uh, or an unpublicized action, when you have an accurate hit, and you, when you have a wedding ceremony being hit and uh, you know 100 people you know wiped out, it suddenly becomes uh, a big deal. Uh, so I think it's 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 uh, statistics about the use and damage you know on the battlefield is uh, very much uh, something that you know, just uh, belongs to the theoreticians of, of weapons development. Uh, I completely agree that you know, just killing one person is way more, for, for a good reason, is way more positive uh, compared to killing you know, just uh, any, any larger num number of people. Uh, specifically, I'm not mentioning you know, just uh, whatever the number could be. So the question, the question is, I think uh, we need to add to your presentation, which I appreciate, uh, uh, also this, this uh, sociological component of how people react to, you know, societies react to <coughs> drone strikes. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> so in Vietnam, you had one million people uh, and over 300,000 killed is like, the entire city of Prague is wiped out in terms of population. In Afghanistan, you had uh, 70,000 as a whole. So 70,000, I don't know, is probably the people living in Kampa. I'm just saying that the level, and it's and is a matter of, if you look, of, look at all the figures, uh, the, how deadly our conflicts nowadays are much less deadly. If you look, I mean, in Vietnam, they were using napalm. Now, your question about the societal uh, cost is important, but the question is, uh, if you bomb with a jet fighter that drops a J-dam that basically wipes out an entire quarter, and you bomb with a uh, drone that that uh, shoots uh, hellfire that basically destroys only a vehicle. Well, to me, the difference is that the drone may make much less destruction. Now, the societal costs are there, but you don't have people massively leaving Middle Eastern countries because of drone strikes. They leave because the, there is a civil war in Syria, because there is a, a civil war in Yemen, and so forth. That was the, the general uh, point. Oh, sorry. Allow me just to, to starve you for a few more minutes with another question. You did not address, address the, uh, the ethical uh, question of the uh, remote control of drone strikes, that we don't put ourselves in a, any danger. It's uh, controlled from somewhere from California across Germany, yeah. and we just see it on, a, on, on our screen. So how is in, in the military, uh, how is this uh, issue 
uh, discussed and with what result? Thank you. Well, I mean, <clears throat> again, uh, we have here decades long trends. Uh, long range precision munitions have not been inv uh, invented with drones. They've been basically fielded uh, starting from the <coughs> mid uh, 50s. So, in a way, again, if you have a, a normal airplane flying at 20,000 feet, dropping a bomb, the pilot won't see the, uh, anybody who is killed because it's too far away. And actually, with, um, uh, with precision munitions, you can actually uh, avoid the conflict area at 300, 500 kilometers away. So there's no way the pilot uh, will see. Drones are just a further evolution. If you, uh, that's, so uh, I don't see that much difference, but the sources are, are in what I've said uh, before, that there is ethical, moral, sociological, legal, technological changes that have basically promoted uh, an increasingly, or at least an attempt to have surgical war. Because at the very end, let's remember, I didn't put the tables about World War II, but if you, you don't need to go that far, you have just to go to Dresden to see what was uh, bombing in World War II, was carpet bombing, because there was no precision munitions. No? Now, with, you can more or less reduce uh, the circular error probability that basically uh, circumscribe the missile into a particular area. Uh, this is uh, economically, uh, I don't know, probably is more expensive economically, but certainly may, at least you have the uh, uh, higher chance of reducing uh, uh, casualties. There is obviously uh, an ethical sociological aspect that is, okay, what about wars fought only with uh, robots and it's legitimate. Uh, I just, that's a very important question. I could not, also because it was a bit off topic from my presentation, but it's very important. Uh, I, don't, I don't work on ethics, so I don't believe it's, uh, I mean, I can give my opinion, but that's, uh, it applies the same value of anybody else's opinion. So I believe in one interjection per presentation. So um, first, I would like to clarify with our colleague from Radio for Europe, the IRA was certainly not one of the most brutal terrorist organizations in history. You had 262 deaths at the hand of the IRA in 30 years, a total of casualties about 1,000. That is paling in insignificance compared to some of the terrorist organizations that exist since then. That being said, you raise a very interesting point that I'd like to go one step further with our presenter today, which is the idea of, the, of you're right, you didn't need uh, drones to, you know, to help overcome uh, the IRA or any number of other insurgencies. Um, but you did need, and you didn't actually use air power either, but you did need like policing efforts. And every time there was a policing effort, it was like tit for tat. British policing efforts were met by IRA increase in violence or different types of violence, different types of networking, different types of training. So I'm wondering if, uh, if Andrea would be able to answer us what kind of countermeasures those that are on the receiving end of drone strikes are adapting or adopting within their strategic thinking to deal with them. Because you don't just sit there and take bombs. And I know that, for example, when it comes to some of the health strike, um, the Hellfire strike missions, especially in Afghanistan, that basically you have spotters that are waiting because there are indicators that an attack's going to come. So I'm wondering if there's a comprehens comprehensive counter, let's say, drone strategy that's being developed amongst insurgents. Yeah, no, that's an important question. Uh, so what you observe, there are different issues, I think. The first is between drone strikes in non-conflict areas, Pakistan, Yemen before the civil war, drone strikes in conflict areas, Iraq, uh, Libya, and so forth. You understand that in a conflict area, it's so messy that it is much more difficult to patrol the, the sky. The, the other aspect is uh, the, the difference between targeted killings that you go, you know that you're targeting a specific individual and the other one is signature strike. So you put this metadata and you kind of guess that you're killing a terrorist and probably, but probably also not. Now, that said, mm, what is known is that, so especially the, the signature strike in general, but also targeted killings work on fusing different types of intelligence. So you generally have uh, special operations on the ground that do some uh, patrolling and gather, uh, it's called human, human intelligence. Uh, then you have sieging platforms that basically gather, uh, intercept uh, telephone communication and so forth. Uh, and then you have also um, 
um, basically cyber attacks in order to hack into the um, uh, g uh, email address of terrorists. You put together all these and then you try to identify where the terrorist is and neutralize. What has created is that terrorists then obviously try to avoid talking on the phone, try to avoid going uh, using their uh, using the internet, try also to go to avoid getting uh, exposed. If you remember, a couple of days ago was the anniversary of the killing of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was not killed with a uh, drone strike; was killed with a cover operation, with a special force operation. No, I mean that put uh, at risk uh, American lives, but because the United States wanted to be sure to have the proof to have killed Osama bin Laden. What is important is that Osama bin Laden was also was recognized through this very complex intelligence chain, and one was also drone. Was um, the nickname is the Beast of Kandahar. The name is RQ-170 Sentinel that basically was flying at some 20,000 feet. That is a very potent um, sensor that could uh, spot a couple of times a person who was tall and it was wearing a beard, had a beard and was, and was fairly thin. And then with some facial recognition softwares, it was possible to have uh, some approximation that was Osama bin Laden. So, uh, and Osama bin Laden was hidden there, not talking with anybody exactly for that reason, because he knew that any kind of contact with the outside world could be risky for his own safety. And still, just by going uh, out, breathe for a couple of minutes per day, was still deadly for him. So. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Thanks a lot. Before we move, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, before we move upstairs for our lunch, which we really deserve, uh, let's uh, agree that we will meet here at uh, two twenty. And uh, I just have to announce you that, unfortunately, uh, our colleague Martin Sokub, he really excused himself, so he will not appear for his presentation. Therefore, the remaining two papers will shift. So we will start with Mitchell Belfer's Life Under Islamic State, and then Gabriela will talk about the uh, gender aspect of the Syrian conflict. So enjoy your meal, and let's meet again in one hour.